we typically recommend you start in the desirability circle. So don't jump right into how to build it, jump into, do people want it? So there are a lot of questions. Who's the customer or who is the user? Sometimes it's the same person, sometimes it's not. What do they want? What makes them want it? How do you know? How do buyers buy? What are they buying? How do you make money? How does it cost? And associated with each of these questions is a different framework. Tell me more about uh, the customer and the user or uh, the problem that you're looking to tackle. The first customer would be burnout teachers, because when you consider the load of expectations that teachers have outlined by a lot of these ministry documents, ideal teaching practices and pedagogical approaches, Ontario Growing Success document, for example, that outlines all the things that teachers should be implementing in their practice to cater towards the diverse learning needs of different students. On paper, we're told all this stuff, but implementing it in practice is next to impossible. Interpreting the curriculum is another one. Translating the curriculum into achievable everyday learning tasks. Often teachers have to resort to one static approach through a textbook, kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. They talk about cross-interdisciplinary education. So combine your subjects, literacy, science, social studies. But again, how to create content or select content that would be cross-curricular and create an integrated learning. I actually want to learn a little bit more about this teacher here. So is the teacher the user of the app or the buyer? Independent schools is going to be our first customer, call it private schools. They're much quicker to adopt things. They have the funding to be able to afford tools like this. Were people talking about this before AI? There's not a lot of resources. There's not a lot of support. And we are expected to do so much beyond what we're capable of all the time. Sometimes it took me half an hour to an hour to write one prompt, and I would argue that's more me than ever. It's just augmented and supersized version of my my abilities. I've got so many custom GPTs that I've created, each with their own purpose. It's what's inspired me to take that leave. I see the potential and I see how much more I was able to be a human being in my classroom and not have to worry about all these areas that I'm struggling with as a teacher or don't know what I can do to help a student. I've worked with different teachers. I've produced for them full units with reading materials, worksheets, and final projects that they can give their students. Thank you for providing this context because this is exactly the way that any of these things start is that you keep talking, I ask questions from time to time, I write as much as I possibly down. Have you ever heard of the jobs to be done? One that I strongly recommend that almost everybody use when building a new product. Think of this as a way of thinking about problems a little bit differently. Um, the, pr the problem may not be framed in the way that people expect, which is the problem is they need to build too much content. The problem isn't necessarily that. The problem is that they're not able to be humans in the classroom. We're not saying we're going to build it. We're going to say we want to help teachers be more human in the classroom. It's more um, inspiring than we're going to build another AI thing, right? As I said, we go through this exercise of starting to define these key objectives that the user or the customer has. The AI value creation process is similar to a workflow. There are a lot of tasks to do. Things like building different content for a student, assessing their reading comprehension. And there are a lot of different tasks that the tool can do. Usually this is the point at which there's everything that we can do and we have to start picking. You essentially map the process of a teacher writing a report card and you build a bit of a swim lane diagram and you go through the process of mapping all of those different activities out so that you can go that right there. That's the one where the AI steps in. We're going to focus on this one here because it will make the most money or because it'll solve the most of their pain or demonstrate that we have a technical solution that works. So you de-risk your process by picking through this value creation process. At this point here, I would probably skip ahead to the AI value model, which is now starting to talk about money. Yes, the value to the user could be infinite, but if they use the value to the customer who actually spends the money, isn't well-defined, you can end up in situations where everybody wants it, but no one will buy it. And that's never the right place to be. Maybe there's still some early validation work you can do. The second yeah. you mentioned that you want to raise funding, I'm sure the questions will be about how you scale this, and then you will probably still run into this whole thing around schools and how to approach them. If you don't know that part of the equation intimately, I would advise to find someone who knows. I think part of de-risking is to see who else is in this ecosystem mm. and how do you de-risk with the parents? That's kind of a must to make it happen. Absolutely. A lot of that have to go with reassuring them about data security, 
avoiding bias, and just presenting the value and showcasing how much of a better job a teacher can do, being augmented with these incredible tools. One of the questions that came up in the chat, and especially for a problem like this in education, is trust. A significant part of user experience comes down to trust. How are you going to control for bias? How about guardrails and controlling the behavior of the LLM to on, only answer questions in a specific ways and decline questions that are not kosher? I think trust is huge, particularly when you introduce technology that's unknown to most people. Like the, the, the whole stereotype of black box, you can build that trust for education, the simplest proof on, on an example that anyone and everyone will understand. So it can be as simple as that. I think transparency and plain language can go a really long way and is really underestimated in most tech solutions. So I want to move on to chicken and egg problem. So is it desirability that comes first or feasibility? Is it the buyer that comes first or the user? That's a very interesting loaded question. Amir. Do small pieces as much as possible in terms of features and dev and then test and iterate. Obviously, you try to validate as much as possible. If that is a desirable thing, then you build, you, you go back, you validate. If, if it's not as desirable, move on to the next thing. A lot of the times you start with a big vision with a big set of features, but then when you work through the little details, you figure out it's not as simple as you mm -hmm. thought. For a company that is heavily resource constrained, mm -hmm. AKA a startup, going after the user is a death sentence. I've done that <laughs> mistake so many times. Going after investor is also a death sentence because if you cannot sustain yourself, mm. you're going to die. It doesn't matter how good your idea is. It doesn't matter how much you've thought about it. I have a very strong opinion against going after investor as a startup. What it will force you to do is to think, how can I make money with this tomorrow? Because if you cannot make money with it, you're not building the right product. The magic when you're getting started is to figure out how users become buyers or buyers become users. And ideally, you find somebody who's both. I think this is the same pattern that you can apply to any chicken and egg scenario. Figure out how eggs become chickens or figure out how chickens do eggs. I think it boils down to go after the early adopters, essentially, and make the experience as best as possible. So, Rish, you asked us a question. We did not talk about that at all. But hopefully, you're leaving with a bunch of new questions. I've never considered this whole buyer versus user. The question is, how do I get this in teachers' hands so that they can feel this magic? What is the best way to have teachers use this, collect their feedback, and really know where to target the approach and how we sell? As a technical guy who's made a lot of mistakes in the past five years, I know that there are an infinite number of interesting technical questions to work on, and that list never gets shortened. So I grounded myself into who's going to pay me for this to clear my mind and focus on, well, this person is ready to pay me right now. And this is the only thing they care about. So that's the only problem that needs to be solved. Having that stick or, and carrot above your head in your prioritization is so important.